because they have no idea what it was like to, to be in a world war. And maybe that will help in the long run that they'll do everything they can that we don't have to go to war. Well, class, um, first off, I want to thank Mrs. Goose for inviting me here to speak to you. And I was drafted on February 19, 1943, at uh, Beatrice, Nebraska. I tried to get into the Navy, and uh, the Navy wouldn't take me account of my eyesight, but the uh, Army didn't pay any attention to that. They, they took me anyhow. I'm Myron Rooker. I was originally with the 324th Infantry Regiment of the 44th Division. I was 19 going to pass these pic th this set of pictures around. You'll have to forgive me my handshake. This one is where I was at Fort Lewis and here we're on uh, maneuvers. And this one here down at the bottom that is was my buddy. We landed on September 15th at Cherbourg, France. And uh, that was on my buddy, Mike De Palmer, as his name, he was from New Jersey, was on his birthday. We went into combat near Looneyville in Avercourt, France, and uh, at two o'clock, they marched us out in an open field near uh, town. We could hear the Germans talking. We were that close. And when daylight came, man, everything broke loose. They shelled us and shot at us. You couldn't even stick your head out of the foxhole because it was bullets hitting all around. And fortunately, shells didn't come quite close enough. It did get some of our men. We spent a total of 204 days in combat and 144 of those without a break. And at that time, that was the longest any outfit had been in combat in one stretch. Some of the cities we took were Frankfurt, uh, Heidelberg, Ulm. I have my dog tags here, and uh, I'll let you pass them around. We uh, advanced in uh, that battle at Avercourt at it was a bad one, and uh, you talk about getting rain and cold and that, and uh, they got us dry clothes, and if that didn't feel good to get uh, dry clothes on again. This is kind of hard for me to uh, tell. We were on defense at the time, and so the Germans were approximately two miles away behind this hill. And there was a building here, kind of like a farm building. And this was wooded area here. So they decided that the Germans probably would have try attacked us at night. So they had us go out and put mines like in a horseshoe, and we put what they call trip wires on them so that the feet, if we buried them mines in the ground, and then uh, that wire run from the top of the mine to the next mine. And if their foot caught in there, that would uh, trigger the mine to go up in the air and go off. Um, so we put those all out and we were to meet back at this building and we all met back and uh, Mike said to me, he said, uh, he always called me Rokes, he said, uh, Rokes, how about a cup of coffee? And I said, yeah, well we didn't have no heat or anything but we had the powdered coffee that, 
And he says, uh, is your cup clean? And I said, uh, yeah, my cup is clean. And uh, he says, well, mine's dirty. He said, let's use your cup. So we mixed the coffee up. And he drank out of one side and I drank out of the other side. And we just had taken a couple uh, drinks out of the coffee. And S Sergeant Dogey came in and he said, uh, Hey, Roker, he said, go with me. He said, I think we forgot to set some of them trips on the mine. And uh, so I handed Mike the cup, and I started to go with him. And then Dog uh, Sergeant Dogie said, oh, no. He said, uh, Mike, you were with me. Roker was with somebody else. You know where they're at. So the two of them went out, and uh, some... They weren't gone five minutes, and I heard explosion. And I figured right away it would be bad news. And uh, Mike, the, the uh, mine took his chest and his face off. And Dogie, he got shrapnel in his right legs. We got killed. He got. They got. Uh, Sergeant Dogie got injured, and Mike got killed by one of our own mines. And I lost him. He was engaged to be married, and uh, there's things you don't understand in war. Sometimes. Uh, I actually break down and and cry at the loss of my buddy. I will say this, at first, most of us veterans didn't have much to say uh, about being in the war. We wanted to get on with life, and we didn't want to bring up their memories. But we have since found out that it is a part of history and the veterans now that are nearing the age of where we'll pass on are opening up and letting people, especially young people, know what it was like. And it's, like I said before, a hell on earth. Before I close here. I don't want any of you to think that I'm a hero because I'm not. The heroes are the ones that lost their lives. They gave the ultimate sacrifice so that this country could be free and that we could live and enjoy life. And don't forget that.